Good morning, everyone. This is Che Rao. I am the Communications Director for the School of Public Affairs. Thank you for joining us this morning for our event, Election 2020, What We Know, What We Don't, and What's Coming. Um, joining us today is Amy Dacey, who's the Executive Director of the Sign Institute of Politics and Policy, of Policy and Politics. Hello, Amy. Um, and also- Politics and Policy Today. <laughs> yeah, Politics and Policy Today, that's correct. I always, you, you gotta make sure that Politics come first today. Um, and also joining us is Betsy Fisher Martin, who is the executive director of the Women in Politics Institute here at the School of Public Affairs. Um, we are going to walk through what has felt like one very long day, but is in fact, it's been three days since uh, the election actually took place. But um, Amy and Betsy are going to walk us through their impressions over the last uh, 72 hours, I would say, um, what, they're, what they've learned, what we think is coming. Um, and what what this all means, uh, if we can even come up with uh, with some sort of theme at this point. But uh, they're going to walk us through that, and then we will take questions from the audience that is watching us on Facebook. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you'll come out of this with some more clarity. Um, but I will recede now and let you two have have at it. Great, thanks, and great to be uh, with you all on this, you know, exciting morning because uh, so much is going on. Um, I think we're all keeping an eye on uh, our Twitter accounts and our New York Times newsfeed and our CNN on the phone and refresh, refresh, know, refresh, refresh, refresh right, what's yes. happening. And um, you know, we I think after as Che mentioned, you know, a long seventy-two hours, um, you know, to go to the theme of what we know, what we don't know, and what's coming, and what we do know really is, you know, this morning, uh, that vote count significantly coming in from um, Pennsylvania, um, from Philadelphia, that put Biden over the top in Pennsylvania. Um, there's still more vote to be counted. So the networks thus far um, have been uh, restraining from actually making the call um, for Biden winning uh, Pennsylvania. And as we know, you know, once he does or if he does win Pennsylvania, that puts him over the top on what he needs to uh, be the president elect. And so I think they're waiting just for some more, another handful of votes to come mm -hmm. in. And then I think that call will be imminent. There's, you know, noticing on my Twitter feed, some organizations are calling it already for Biden, but Thus far, AP and the main networks, as far as I know, haven't called it yet. Out of yes, list. yes, I think they're they're holding their you know uh, uh, reserving to to get some more votes in and and you know I think Betsy to me what we know we knew this was going to look this way. I mean, it shouldn't come as a surprise. You know, uh, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. One campaign really encouraged you know, their voters to vote early and vote by mail. The other said, wait till election day. And so we knew in a decentralized process, like, you know, the United States, each state is gonna have a different process. Some counted before, some counted after. So it's always been kind of about, dis for the Biden team, dismantling that 270 strategy Trump won by in 2016. These states we're still waiting on were always a key factor in that play. Right. Um, and I think once you saw Biden flip Wisconsin, flip Michigan, suddenly the math to get to 270, you know, uh, Trump needed a, President Trump needed a different path than he had in 2016. So we're seeing that. Right. And what we saw, you know, in 2016 was that blue wall crumble, right? Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And what we're seeing now is kind of brick by brick, <laughs> day by day, vote by vote, right. um, that really kind of coming back and most likely will be what puts uh, Biden over the top. But, yeah. you know, it, it's, I think the networks um, did a good job of forecasting that this was going, you know, this is a different election year. Right. Um, coronavirus has certainly impacted so many people's lives and th the voting process in this campaign is no exception. Um, we saw, yeah, you know, not only did we have a record number of uh, people voting, which is a great thing, we have record numbers of people voting early and voting by mail. Right. And, right. you know, uh, just, you know, living through this discussions now about comparing things to 2000 when we didn't have you know, a clear victory on election night and having worked into television at that point and being part of, you know, Florida, Florida, Florida all night right. and the networks mm -hmm. getting the calls wrong and, you know, mistakes being made. In this case, nothing has gone wrong. Um, there is no, um, you know, problem with the ballots. 
There is no hanging chads. There's no butterfly ballots. This is just a simple problem of having a lot of absentee votes to count Absolutely. in a state like Pennsylvania that did not allow, you know, interestingly enough, the Republican legislature did not allow a pre-count or pre-processing of those absentee ballots. And you've got a very large population center in uh, in Philadelphia, of course, and mass quantities it's of huge. votes that have to it's be counted. Huge. And to your point, in a great way, we've seen more people voting. That's all we really yes. want in this democracy, more people voting. But in a time of a global pandemic, a lot of these states created new opportunities. They, they used to require, um, you know, uh, they had to have an excuse for absentee or there wasn't as much early voting or there yeah. wasn't as much vote by mail. So what we're seeing is like, if our turnout's on track right now, they're predicting like 66, 67%. Like when you look back in 16, 59, you know, 12, it was 54, 57, 08. This is a big influx, you know, of voters. I think the other interesting thing you know, to watch is, is, you know, the makeup of that as well. I mean, it's, it's great to hear, you know, already Vice President Biden has more votes than any other candidate in presidential history, but Donald Trump also received 4 million more votes so far than he did in 2016. So the breaking down of that electorate will be really interesting to see where, you know, some of this uh, explosion was, where, you know, um, it was moving. But I don't know about you, Betsy, I think the one thing that we're really seeing and know right now the divide is still big, the red, the blue. That's why these races are so close and going down vote to vote. And it's very urban and rural also. Yeah, and so, I mean, yeah, when you look at that map and a lot of the news organizations, I encourage people to kind of look at the density map of the yeah. vote and it's incredible. And it, you know, it does go to that saying that land doesn't vote people do, right? And <laughs> exactly. The, you know, these large swaths of dark blue circles in urban areas around the country, and then the small scatterings of red um, along the vast, you know, rural areas. And you've got this, you know, push and pull between cities and uh, rural areas. And then what's in the middle is literally yeah. <laughs> the suburbs. And that's where you have some of that push and pull swing vote happening that, you know, we talk so much about this election year. Yeah. And one thing I'll add, I want to get your take, certainly a lot of other elections happen beyond the presidential. And I know that's the focus right now. One last thing on the presidential that I think, you know, is certainly, you know, really interesting too, is just to see, you know, how, this was so much in the courts and not a lot of people realize this before election day, over 30 cases in 12 states about, you know, for Republicans, some of it was restricting the vote, you know, trying to make sure that processes. So a lot was happening legally before. So now the big question is each state has a plan in place for a recount. Some of them are automatically triggered if it's in 0.5%, 1%, some the candidate has to, to look for. I think the interesting part so far is all the legal action so far taken by the, the Trump campaign has been to kind of stop the counting. You know, they did get some victories to say that they wanted their, their you know, um, witnesses in the room when some of this is happening. But there are also systems in place for each of these states if they're gonna, you know, and their legal right to question, you know, some of this. But this is not just starting now. There's been a lot of legal things happening before actually election day, you know, to decide who, who votes, how they vote, why they vote, you know, where they vote, those kind of questions. Exactly. And, you know, we do have seen some of that mixed messaging. You mentioned, you, you know, the uh, Trump campaign saying stop the vote, but in places like Arizona, where, um, you know, where Biden was ahead, you know, then it's count the vote. Right, <laughs> and you can't right. really have it um, both ways. But, you know, just to go back to the fact that, you know, it's, we've got, you know, there's no one overall election system. We've got different states, each has different laws different ways of counting the vote. Um, and it's it's definitely frustrating for people, right? Because yeah. one of my favorite memes uh, that I saw yesterday on Instagram was, you know, American Idol can count 130 million votes in a commercial break. <laughs> Why can't we seem to, you know, count ballots? But, you know, people just have to be patient with the process and realize that, you know, this uh, year especially, um, is, is very different. And um, we have to just wait until, you know, the votes come in and every legal vote is counted. Yeah. And in a lot of respects, a lot of this is in campaigns hands as they're talking to voters, encouraging them up to election day. Yeah. But now this is really about certifying these elections, you know, in each state, letting the election administrators. And I have to say, 
kudos to all the people who have been working nonstop to count these ballots, right? You know, through the week. And then you know, the process next is then you're gonna have these elections certified by state. The next big date is in December when the electors come together and vote. And then in January, we're gonna see a Congress, you know, certify that election, see if there's any challenges. So those are the next big dates. And just a reminder, no concession speech, no, you know, victory speech and no, you know, uh, press announcement totally certifies this election. You know, there is a process in place, so. Right, and that brings us to sort of the, what we don't know, right? right? We don't know how this is going to end in the sense of how it's going to play out. I guess we know how it will probably end, right? Um, if things are going the way they're going, but we don't know, for example, um, if, um, you know, if, if Biden is, um, you know, declared the winter and has the votes, we don't know what's going to happen with President Trump if there will be a concession. Um, you know, there's certainly nothing that stipulates a concession has to be made, although, right. you know, as we know, it is certainly protocol. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Hillary Clinton picked up the phone in 2016 and conceded to um, Donald Trump. Um, we don't know if that's going to happen. Um, the people inside the White House, as everyone could probably tell from that, um, you know, uh, train wreck of a um, press, not even press conference because he didn't take any questions, but yeah, uh, it was remarks, just a statement, like a verbal statement you know, but... from the White House, right, that, um, you know, had clearly been pre-written and people around the president, you know, feeding in, you know, falsehoods and misinformation that then, get translated to the people. And I will just say from a media perspective, you know, mm -hmm. several of the networks um, cut him off completely and just said, enough, we're not going to broadcast complete falsehoods from the White House. I think that was interesting because, and you know, I always say, Betsy, the, the most overserved word in 2020 is unprecedented, right? Yeah. Like we, we <laughs> get so much, but again, last night, that was something that you don't always see. I mean, they, right. they usually cover this piece of it. So, so that's the process. One interesting thing that what we don't know, I think is, is fascinating. Let's get to some of these other races, like yeah. the Senate's in the balance, right? right. Might have some runoffs in Georgia to help decide that. And then certainly with all the amazing you work you do, really interesting in the House and Senate, women elected, you know, so the one interesting thing I will say about the runoff in the Senate, you've got the, the, the Congress being sworn in and, and in January, and I think the runoff happens after that, and then the, ele you know, the certification, the election happens after that, the timing of all this is unbelievable. Right. And what happens if you've got those two runoffs in Georgia, you have a, you know, you could have a lame duck President Trump, right? Um, how does the Trump factor into, you know, do, being out and campaigning, those are key to U.S. Senate races. How is Trump going to be utilized um, to get out the vote in those um, key Senate races? We're going to see a ton of influx of money um, yeah. into those races as well. And so, you know, again, and what the, we don't know, what is that, what is that going to look like? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you mentioned, you know, women, um, certainly now, you know, in 2018, Year of the Woman, we sort of set this record, and now that's continued. Um, we have now even more women uh, coming into the House. I think the number is at like at 106 or 107 with, you know, again, several races. The presidential is not the only race undecided. There are a lot of these house recounts races. In, in some of these house races and yeah. states. Yeah, and yeah. not even just recounts, but some of them don't have all of the votes yeah. in. So we're still waiting on some calls. So that number could even grow. The difference this time, of course, is in 2018, we saw in the year of the woman, um, we saw so many Democratic women being elected, 35 new uh, Democratic women being elected to the House, bringing their total number to like 89. And we only saw one Republican woman elected. And so the Republican women, um, to their credit, really used that as a wake up call and organized and um, put a lot of money, time and effort into recruiting and thinking about some women candidates to get through the primary process. Um, and to have successful campaigns. And that happened at the um, NRCC uh, with their recruitment chair, uh, Susan Brooks. Uh, it happened certainly in a number of um, PACs like BUPAC and EPAC and Winning for Women. And now Amy used to um, be the director of Emily's List, which right. is the counterpart 
um, on the Democratic side. And so you know how important it is. And, you know, Emily's list is, you know, the big kahuna of them all with millions and millions and millions of dollars going into campaigns and Republicans way on the other side of that. But um, they have started to try, at least, um, to infuse some dollars into those races. And I think it, it paid off for them. And, you know, from my perspective, you know, running an institute on women in politics, whose mission is really to close that gender gap in political leadership, um, you can't do that when you have an imbalance within the two political parties um, in terms of- um, and, I, and I do think this is one of the first cycles that you've seen, you yeah. know, Emily's List is not a part of the party. It is an outside right. entity to kind of help push and force, you know, to get more women in the primary process, because that's where you have to get them in to, to further. And so we saw a lot more recruiting to your point, you know, yeah. in a lot of these outside organizations too. And, you know, this, you grow on each one and now more Republican women are seeing Republican women in office. And I think the recruiting will even go, you know, better for that. So I, I do think, you know, that was a big takeaway um, right. from, from this cycle. Yeah. And as you know, you've got to get, you know, candidates in place well in advance. I mean, you don't know two years out how the map is going to look, what the political winds are going to do. I mean, there was no way to predict two years ago that Republicans, and they did have a pretty good um, night in terms of um, House vote, right? Um, and even in the Senate, there were some, you know, races that they ended up pulling out that people thought that they would lose. And so you've got to have those good, strong candidates to take advantage of the political winds, whichever way they blow. Right. And I think another thing we don't know is as we're watching what's happening on the top and flipping some of these states blue on the national level, what happened with the state legislatures? I know the, the Democrats thought they'd flip a lot of them, especially with redistricting coming up. There was some losses, you know, with incumbents in the in the House caucus. Um, you know, the Senate, they felt, you know, really good about. They were able to flip some seats. I think we're still, you know, in Arizona and Colorado look, you know, but what happened? And I think that that'll be the, the next step, the what we don't know, going deep into some of these districts to find out you know, why was some of the messaging, did, did you know, uh, did Trump do better in those areas than, than the, you know, incumbents? And, and, you know, so that'll be things that, that we're looking at in the days ahead as, right. as we navigate this and, and certify this national, you know, election as well to kind of look a little deeper in that. And when we sort of do those postmortems too, another thing that will come into play is what the heck happened with polling? Um, yeah, you know, a big question. Michael, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of hand wringing that's already started over that process because, as we all know, you know, the polls really predicted much more of a uh, blue wave, um, not only the top of the ticket but down below as well, right? And um, that did not materialize, uh, materialize, although it should be noted that, you know, certainly at the end of the day, Biden will have received, you know, over 4 million votes um, than Trump in the popular vote. But, you know, some of these state by state polling um, numbers were significantly off and, you know, questions about the methodology, whether there is such a thing as a shy Trump voter that doesn't you know, uh, admit that to pollsters. I, I, you know, there's a lots of different theories running around as what happened and why, but I can tell you campaigns and news organizations spent millions of dollars on polling um, that at the end of the day ended up not being anywhere near the end result. And I, and I think it's an important thing to, to realize, you know, they're looking at how the polling was in some of these down ballot races too, because you know polling is just a snapshot in time, not necessarily a predictor. But when you see some continuity and consistency in the polls, that's the question. And there was a lot of fundraising that happened around these. There was a lot of, and, and I don't think everybody realizes how much a campaign manager and operative that that team relies on that data and that information to make strategic decisions about their campaign, whether it's spending or whether it's how, what voters they're reaching out to or message testing, what issues they want to talk about. So again, to your point, is it the, is it the mechanism? Is it the, the, you know, is, is it just getting harder to reach people? I know a lot of pollsters say just to get to that sample size that really gives you an accurate count is challenging. Were people less leery, you know, it, it, did the pandemic also affect this, you know, and what we're talking about? So I yeah. think there's that, and there's going to be a really great conversation from both sides, I think, after about what kind of voter contact did they do in a year where, you know, uh, there, there was COVID and going door to door and doing rally. There, it wasn't at the level, even if though Trump did some rallies and did some, door, it wasn't at that level that it's been before. So how did that affect it? Yeah, exactly. And that certainly impacted, I mean, we certainly see that the Biden campaign have, excuse me, to limit their, 
you know, um, person to person voting, these big rallies. You saw President Trump certainly having many of them, but um, the Biden campaign, you know, by and large limited to like, you know, car rally, car drive in. I like the honking though. I hope yeah, you keep a lot the honking. of honking. Like Although no one quite figured out how to get people to stop honking once <laughs> yeah. speaking. Uh, that was a little distracting. But, you know, and even the exit polls, I will say, you know, for us, um, you know, in academia who love pouring through exit polls, we seem to be way off yeah. and um, they're really going to have to be weighted. I mean, I see. Uh, stories that are kind of being written off of some of these exit polls, and it's a little frustrating, especially with women. I mean, the exit poll had, you know, white women with a college degree voting for Trump by one, you know, Trump up one among that subset. You mentioned and that, that to me, and that that's was... Not, that, that's that's not, just not true. That right? happened, right? So... Right, and so some of these numbers floating around, and I just would caution people to be wary of when you're reading about various demographics and how they voted. We just don't know that yet. Those exit polls need to go back and they reweight them and you know they come out in different waves and hopefully we'll have something reliable to look at because you know in academia and political operatives I mean the exit polls are a really good insight into these different demographics and how they voted and why yeah and, and Betsy I could do this with you all day long oh, but Jay, I, I, there are other questions like and yeah. I don't know what you're doing this afternoon but we should you know <laughs> yeah, exactly go for it Jay um, yeah, so we are starting to get some questions. And the first one, Betsy, you touched on it a little bit, the polling, just the, yeah. uh, you know, I know in uh, in Maine, for example, Gideon was polling ahead of Collins yeah. uh, for the last couple months uh, by quite a bit, by six points or so. I don't think anything showed her lo by winning by a smaller margin than that. And in the end, Collins won by about eight points. So one of the first questions we have is, you know, are the digital advancements that we have now, I mean, cell phones and 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 the different ways that you can be contact and text messaging and all of that is is that hurting polling i mean i, I mean have you heard some uh, either of you heard discussions with, uh, with campaigns that you might have had over the last couple of days of talking about a whole scale change in the way that polling is conducted or polling, yeah i mean it's a good question polling has changed um and most of the polls these days certainly don't just rely on you know the home phone um polling of old right and a lot of it now is a combo of home phones cell phones internet polls online um there's a lot of different methodologies that um that are going into these polls so that seems to have adapted but i mean into that like what do we don't know category i think goes that question as we don't know exactly um what went wrong and as you point out it's not just the presidential that was wrong it was in some of these you know key senate races where you know you point out in maine was very very um different and you know people seeing the race in south carolina um mm -hmm. with lindsey graham and jamie harrison as being close um, that certainly was not close. Um, and so this was, you know, up and down the ballot that polling missed the mark in a lot of places. Amy, what do you think on that? Yeah, I mean, I do think, again, it, this is this is important to, to ask these questions because like I said, having been, been on the other side and a manager and sitting with your pollster <laughs> and talking about, you know, what you're doing, they even use some of these sometimes to decide if they're going to get in, in a race and, you know, for, for um, recruiting purposes. So I think that there will be a serious look into that. And I think it's always been also, you know, we've got so much now with data, data analytics and modeling, right? This has been something over the last several national elections and certainly the midterms that campaigns are using more. And I think the question is sometimes there's been a reliance, like let's use the modeling data analytics let's use the polling, like what's the combination of the two also that help? But polling is such a public thing. They certainly use it for, like you said, fundraising to, to, to garner support. Um, and I think the other thing is, it's not just the individual pollsters on campaigns. You know, some of these, uh, you know, news media outlets, you know, other institutes that do these, it's a question about, are they seeing the same thing? So what is going on here? So I do think there'll be a question around that. Yeah, for sure. What else, Che? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then the other question is the, the big the big thing that's happening outside of the election, obviously, is COVID. And there's yeah. no, um, denying that that played a role in this election, especially in the early voting that people undertook. And uh, is there going to be a lasting sort of influence on elections going forward with early votes, with early voting, with people taking advantage of that? Do you see that as something possibly happening or in a non-COVID election, would we revert back to most people voting in person on the day of the election? Listen, I think 
the interesting thing is in a global pandemic, we have more people voting than ever before. And that's because remove the pandemic from this conversation. People just want more options in how they vote. They want early votes a great thing. They don't, they're not able to do it on election day. Election day is not a national holiday. You know, some people are like, they get to the polls and the poll lines are long and they have to get to work. You know, some it's just convenient because of what they're doing. You know, I think there's some people who took advantage of it because they were concerned about the healthcare risk. I think the bottom line is these some states are completely vote by mail, right? And that's not gonna to, to revert. But I think what this taught us is if people have more options, have more opportunities to vote in an election, they will take them, you know? And so to me, it's more about um, states looking at, you know, they were very honest, some of these states, Nevada's election, people said this, Pennsylvania's, like we weren't necessarily prepared on the front end for this influx of it, you know? And so what are the systems in place to make sure if that becomes the preferred mechanism for a lot of people that they're able to process and do them? And again, and if anything also came out of here is you can have more people voting by mail, but the question is, are you counting them before election day? Right. Are you, you know, have enough it's resources to tally them? Yeah, it's the process. Yeah. So I, you know, I think that states will look at it as like a tool in their toolbox to hopefully open up and have more voter access. I think there's been certainly a push for this. These community drop boxes, you know, um, were a big factor in a lot of places. Access to those, you know, some states like Texas should have probably had them in more, you know, places. But I do think for communities that are looking for more ways to cast their vote, um, I think that's the important thing. And we pushed out so heavily, have a plan to vote. It's not just to say I'm going to vote, but having a plan to vote, you have to know how you're going to vote, when you're going to vote, and you know what what are these mechanisms you're going to use. I don't know, Betsy, if you feel yeah, the same. Yeah, uh, but Amy, like what, you know, it's interesting because um, the politics comes into play here. Course, yes. Right? Yeah. And there is this, you know, widespread notion that more votes equals more Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. And that the more people, the easier it is to vote, the more access people have, that helps Democrats. And so you've got this push on the other side, this pullback from Republicans who instinctively um, try in many cases to make it more difficult uh, to vote. I mean, just witness what happened in, in Pennsylvania, right? Is the Republican legislature there that didn't make it easy access to actually process and count some of these absentee ballots. Take a state like Texas. Uh, my daughter's in school there and wanted to register to vote there. Not an easy process. Yeah. Um, you know, there is no absentee real vote in Texas unless you have got like a concrete, you know, verifiable excuse that you're going to be out of the state. Um, and then if you are there, as she voted early, um, you have to have a Texas driver's license or a Texas state ID. Well, college students don't have that. Mm -hmm. And the alternative is to bring your passport. Now, how many college kids do you know that go to college with their passport? My daughter, who's a freshman, certainly did not. And so, you know, I had to send the passport down for her um, so she could go vote down there. They don't make it easy, right? Mm -hmm. And there is that politics gets involved in voter access. And why is that? I mean, as someone who was- Well, so I think that's because a lot of these positions, Betsy, as yeah. you know, are elected positions. Yeah. You refer to the Republican Secretary of State in State X, or yeah. the legislatures make a lot of decisions. And I think that was the other, you know, big factor in the states that the vote was delayed, a lot of those, a lot of these things could have been avoided if the legislature came together and literally said, you can start counting earlier exactly. than you are. So it is politicized in a little way, and that's a lot of the decentralization. But I do think that you're seeing, like I said, so many cases to litigate some of these pillars, some of these like, you have to have prepaid postage, right? To right. Have access. You have to have, you know, the ability, you know, to do this. So it is because in a lot of these are a lot of political positions. There's not as many, you know, just impartial board of elections that make some of these decisions. But I think in that respect, you know, um, people have to push and ask, you know, for this too. And I think, you know, once you give somebody an option to do this, I think it'll be harder to take it, you know, away. And a lot of ba battles were fought in this election cycle to garner more access, you know, and those were won in, in a lot of places. So I think you will see people challenge that if they say we're going to pull back on that. But you're right. It's a very political process, a decentralized political process, state by state. Right. And a lot of people are giving a lot of credit in, in Georgia, which we see tightening up to the work that Stacey Abrams has done there uh, for voter access, right? 
Yeah, and that was that was cycle after cycle. This was a long term yeah. investment. Yeah. You know, at one point when she was running, uh, there was seven hundred thousand eligible voters that hadn't been, you know, registered in the state. Going through that process, making sure they had access, making sure that they could do that, and a lot of the work that you saw in Georgia and what you you know happened, and and you know you, you've got to make sure that that it, it, it's just as like we said, you look at that urban versus you know suburban versus rural breakdown. You know what are these? If it's decentralized, what are these communities and how are they making decisions? And people in urban areas, you know, with the density issue around you know, coronavirus, that was a different, you know, scenario than in some of these rural places where, you know, do they have access to vote? So you have to look at the communities, you know, as well. But a lot of this is like disenfranchising, not only by party, but by different communities. Um, and, and I think that uh, it, it shed a light a lot on the process. Like people, right. I think, do understand the process a lot more. There was a lot of education that went around on elections. So I'm, we're almost out of time and I'll leave you with one last question. It's a big question, obviously, but with the election, um, Biden has, is it a, quite a bit ahead in the popular vote by probably about 4 million votes at this yeah. point when it's all said and done might end up with five or 6 million more votes, but the electoral college is very close. Um, it's hinging on very, um, a few states and thousands of votes in between those states. The conversation will continue about the value of the electoral college. What, oh, yeah. this, what has this election sort of what kind of insights have you gleaned from that? Is that a conversation that's going to continue or is there way in a close election like this, are we just going to see this continue? The, the electoral college kind of is here to stay. Well, you know, in many cases, you know, it is a little bit of minority rule in a certain extent, but you know, this is the system that we have in place. I mean, if you did just popular vote, you know, you would, it would change the way campaigns are run. Um, there would be a tremendous focus on the population centers and is, you know, that would, that would fundamentally change, um, change politics, right, Amy? I mean, it's just yeah. it would be an entirely different, entirely different game, right? It would. And, and when you're talking about things being political, Democrats have won six out of the last seven popular votes, right? Yeah. So I, I think the question is, um, you know, there's that piece of it. It's the people who actually get to make that decision, you know, are political in nature. And this is this is about who's in control and in power at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I also think if you're a campaign manager and you're about to run a national campaign, it really would change, you know, let's do what's just and right and like make sure that, you know, people have a say in this, but it would be really interesting from the perspective of suddenly, how much time are you spending in California and Texas and New York, you know, right. some of these yeah. population centers yeah. and, and, you know, are these some of these states that have played such a key role? How are the, how is that going to change, um, you know, and investments? It, it would be interesting, but again, a lot of this is Political, we see, you know, people will say there's a certain advantage for one party or over the other if you if you go in that direction. And then the question is, who makes this decision? Right. You know, and it would have to be, you know, um, done in a way that the Congress is involved. And I, you know, I just don't know to see that happen. But I do think, because of the history here, there's going to be a lot more outside push. There's there's a lot of will. I think that you know some of these movements to get rid of the electoral college have definitely gained a lot of um, momentum. And if you're just solely looking at what happened in 16 and what happened in 2020, I think the conversation will be very much, you know, vocal around this and you might see more of an outside push for change. Yeah, and I mean, the same process happens in the primary too. I mean, we have a, a, a strange primary process where, you know, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina are at the beginning of the, the calendar. And if it was, if it was different, right? If there was a national primary, you know, you would see the candidates park themselves in New York City, California, and Texas, right? Right. Yeah. So it has consequences, but um, this is- I'll put that into the what we don't know category right exactly. now. Right there. <laughs> well, uh, we're out of time today, um, and there's still a lot of breaking news probably that will come over the wire over the next, uh, next several hours, but- yeah. um, we will continue this conversation. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Amy, for joining us today. Um, you, we yeah. are sure um, to have more um, uh, more insight from our faculty um, over the next couple months. So please stay tuned for more events from uh, the School of Public Affairs. We appreciate uh, your time today. And again, thank you to both of our panelists. Um, and uh, you know, we'll see where we are in January. Great. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so Great much.